<laughs> there we are. Yeah. So my clock's reading 4.14, so we still got another minute. Okay. Have you folks, since the last year, uh, had to accumulate more electronics? I found out that I needed another monitor. I've got a keyboard now. I have a mouse I haven't had in years. And I even have a repeater on my um, system, uh, basically a cell boost, so that it can enhance my uh, my both my Wi-Fi as well as, as uh, the um, internet speed. It's just incredible. <laughs> All this wire around me now that I never thought we'd have to do again. Oh, no doubt. Anyone who had home office stuff, even the ring lights, I actually don't have mine, which is a pity for today, but the ring lights for yes. broadcasting and all that stuff, you know, everyone's now kitted out at home. We just bought, I mean, on March 11th, we sent our team home. And then on March 12th, we sent everybody monitors and stuff. Is that right? In fact, I was thinking about getting my ring light. Alex Smithsonian wants the mic. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do we do? Do we know how to do that? Uh, yeah, you press the purple button, but I'm I'm not touching anything. <laughs> Push the purple button. Yeah, that says uh, that it's it's a it says where the mic is. If you push him, you can he'll let you, he'll you let him in. To the right of the. Is he the person? Maybe. It might be the MC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm pushing buttons. Who knows what button I'm pushing? All right. So um, let's see. 4.15. I'm saying 4.15, Alex. Should we? I expected someone to come in and say, let's go. I guess that's you. <laughs> All right. So, so we'll start, and if somebody comes on and says, no, you kicked off early, um, well, we will restart. Um, but let's, let's, let's get going. Um, I'm going to start just for everybody who's, who's listening to the conversation. Um, I'm going to read a quick opening statement. Um, we'll do sort of a round of introductions, and then we'll get into the, the, the real meat of um, the session um, What's going on? So basically, um, I, I'll point out that several years ago, I did some research comparing the difference between love and trust. What I discovered is that there are some brands we love, um, but love doesn't is not the same thing as trust. They're very different. There are other brands that we will love and trust. People will use the brands that they love but their interest in engaging with companies with different organizations and the level of interaction they have is based on trust. Um, so, so just because somebody loves you, that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to interact and work with you. The, the Edelman Trust Barometer puts our trust rating at an all-time low. I think the last score was 48 – in the U.S., 48 percent of the people said that they trust our public and private institutions. Um, that's not very good score. It's been steadily going down over the last decade. As those trust – Trust declines, economics becomes more difficult, and our ability to accomplish things um, as a team also is undermined. Oh, we've been joined by somebody else. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm late in joining. Uh, oh, no problem. I can't hear you. We, is new. <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> So, so anyway, the, 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 the reason with trust that we try to collaborate, we want to do things economically, and all of that is undermined um, when our trust begins to decline. So trust becomes a really fundamental issue that underlines the way we interact with each other. Um, and at a time when we find ourselves facing significant challenges, perhaps some of the most we've faced at any one time, our ability to respond because of the we can trust has actually been the weakest. Um, so with that... Um, why don't we just go around the horn and let everybody introduce themselves. Um, I'm Jerry Power. I'm CEO of i3 Systems. Um, we're building sort of a platform that allows uh, data exchanges in sort of a trusted environment. Um, so we manage that, that negotiated feeling of trust between different organizations as they start to exchange data. Michael, you want to go next? We'll just work our way around the screen. 
Uh, Michael Drexler, Chief Strategy Officer at Brightstar Capital, um, a mid-market focused U.S. private equity firm that works a lot with families and family-owned businesses where trust and legacy are big issues. And so we're, we're at the cold phase of this and looking forward to this conversation. Next. Tr Trish, you want to go? Yeah, so... My name's uh, Tris Dyson. I'm the founder and managing director uh, of Nesta Challenges. Uh, and we develop challenge prizes with governments and companies around the world, which is about crowdsourcing uh, solutions to important problems. Oliver? Sure. Hi, I'm Oliver Libby. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of a uh, venture firm and holding company in New York called HL Ventures. I also co-founded a global nonprofit to help college students launch social ventures called the Resolution Project, and I'm delighted to be here. And Gail. Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Gail Gannon. I'm the managing director of Wave Edge Capital, which is a boutique investment bank company, as well as the co-founder and uh, CEO of a company called Ansante. We work with uh, health tech and um, actually all tech capital uh, for around the globe for early stage startup companies. And I'm delighted to um, engage in this uh, conversation about uh, trust and how to actually cultivate that both from the ground up in early stage companies all the way to the global 50. Okay. So, so let's start the conversation. Just talk about the, the situation with respect to trust. Um, I think certainly COVID has, has put trust right in front of us and made it a very visible issue. Um, but trust, it, it, a lot of what's going on in COVID is actually just an echo of sort of our relationship to, to companies and trust in general. Um, so with that, I don't, I don't know if you have, if you guys have any stories or, or you want to talk a little bit about your perceptions about how you see trust and, and your day to day dealings and what's been going on. Maybe I'll, I'll have a quick go and trust is in arguably the simplest thing in the world and the most difficult thing in the world because at a very fundamental level, if, if I trust you, it's because you told me what you're going to do and then you did it and it all worked out exactly as planned. And if you had an agenda, you would have disclosed it early on and we would have been fine even with the, in the presence of agendas. I think what we've seen over the last year in particular is two things. One, um, agendas weren't disclosed and I'm thinking of the early um, mask, no mask debate in public health officials where there was a very laudable agenda, it just wasn't disclosed and therefore statements were issued that ultimately proved to be wrong and that's a bad thing for trust and then the second thing is because we were in lockdown and social interactions in the physical world became lower I think there was a retrenchment to echo chambers and we've seen some of that as well. And that means we don't see the other person. We don't view them as people and persons. We box them, we demonize them, and things go bad. And, and those were the two trends I saw over the last year. And So I would like to echo some of what you had said. One of the things that I, uh, uh, especially along the whole idea of mask wearing and all, one of the, the things that we considered like sort of trusted knowledge got challenged uh, because um, science had a lot of ambiguity to it. There's a lot of inconclusivity in terms of understanding the pandemic. I think um, that affected our trust threshold because uh, science wasn't as, as conclusive as it could have been or can be. And then there was also this will, the political agenda on top of that. So that we created a, a layer of confusion and uh, to the ambiguity of, if, of both information as well as messaging. So I would say that's something that um, has to be fleshed out. And it's uh, amazing to me as, a, as an, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. So it's amazing to me to see that there was a challenge about the fact that what what we as scientists believe strongly and the information that we know of, um, there was this whole sense in the world, actually, about 
what, what, what really is science and what's a fable. And I think that's going to be a, a very important threshold to get over, uh, especially in now that we've become more technically enabled uh, because a, a lot of technology is founded on us on hard science. And so that's going to be um, a really interesting uh, correction or corrective factors that we need to do in terms of our, our responsibility and, and the kinds of messages that we actually send both at, at, in terms of corporations as well as into, at government levels. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, uh, that trust is one of maybe the most critical thing in a society, right? You know, one of the, you know, the first time where two people ran across one another and, you know, tens of thousands of years ago and said, you know, I'm not going to kill you. You're not going to kill me. Let's actually get together and do something. I'll watch the home and you go find it. Uh, what we've seen with COVID, and I've, I've said this a lot, is that COVID ac accelerated existing trends. And the uh, the waning of trust in institutions is one of those trends that was dramatically increased. And if you look around, right, if we a, a good, strong and effective response to COVID that would have minimized the damage would have required a high degree of trust in science and in doctors, in governments, uh, local, state and, and federal and even global organizations and uh, and in business to trust that you know, these vaccines are good and all that. And instead, what you ended up with was because trust in all institutions is at a low, according to the Edelman report. And I think we can look around and see that. That, um, that the response was far from optimal. And then that's pretty universal, right? So I think, you know, we saw firsthand what happens when trust is at a low is that it, it actually decreases the effectiveness of society. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think the, the, the pandemic um, accelerate, accelerated a decline in trust um, that was already happening, particularly in our public institutions uh, and in government. And, and it's, it, it's an example of, a broader set of, 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 of complex issues and problems where there is a lack of knowledge or capacity or competence and understanding in public institutions in knowing how to deal with it. And we just need to be a bit more honest about that. Um, and I think that the, the default model that government and public institutions use for dealing with us as citizens or as companies is either as the kind of, you know, like the sheriff's office telling us what we can and can't do, which is often too much or too little, uh, or it's this idea that it's sort of dominoes, um, you know, delivering public service to, to us um, as customers. But that doesn't work with complex problems because vaccines, um, it's not pizza, uh, essentially. And so I think there needs to be a shift in the way that, government and public institutions think about how they work more collectively with citizens and with companies and with um, collective intelligence using data in order to address some of these emerging issues and problems, including the pandemic. So what I, a couple of things I think about, and I, and I don't think this is talked about enough, but there's real economic impact to lack of trust. Um, and, and, and Trish, you sort of started to go in this direction a little bit on one of the issues. Um, but when there's not trust, you can't collaborate as well with outside parties because you only collaborate with the people you trust. So, so by not trusting, it actually impedes our ability to sort of make progress as, as, as a group. So we have less outcomes because collaboration is, is muted. The, the other thing that I think about is I think about um, people who are with a finance background. They're used to taking the term risk and being able to equate it to an economic value. And when there's not trust, obviously the risk goes up because you're worried, well, what if the other person didn't do what I expected them to do or whatever, whatever. But that translates. There's an economic impact because people that can be measured by, by finance people. Um, I think that the fact that trust is so low, it actually impedes our ability economically as well. And, and we think about a more societal issue, which is true, but there's real economic impact to what we're talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> if you if you look at the way that trust is is 
um, if, if you read that Edelman report, not to refer back to it, but one of the things that's interesting about it is that what remains relatively high is people's trust in their next door neighbor, basically their friends, right? So, and this is one of the reasons that social media has become so powerful is, and there's probably a bit of a chicken and the egg issue here, but people believe what their friends are saying to them, um, at least as much, if not now more than an accredited expert or a government official or a senior executive, right? And what's interesting about that is it means that <clears throat> when you're trying to get something done in the business world, you have to get a lot of people to agree with you, which means that you're spending an enormous amount of money on social media, advertising, retargeting, and data-oriented uh, uh, things, rather than, you know, just having something that's widely regarded as, as worthwhile and therefore people uh, should buy it or, or should engage in that activity. So it's interesting when you think about where trust has been kind of pushed down to the one-to-one -one relationships, the effect that that's had on the ability to transact and do business and um, and even trust in the markets, right? I mean, not to belabor it, but, you know, what happened recently with, with GameStop, you know, I think most financial analysts would say that it had nothing to do with the underlying value of the asset, but it became this flywheel where people were recommending it to each other and people made economic decisions, often with their 401ks. Well, yeah, so I, you, you touched on an interesting point that I think I like to flush out a little bit more about the trusting your neighbors versus trusting something that's more amorphous. So, you know, the fact that we're all sheltered in place, so we do not have that kind of one-to-one uh, -one connection anymore, and, and actually seeing people in the room to be able to feel and, and sense them, I think is is, is is definitely exacerbated the issue. But also, there's this opportunity that I see that perhaps we haven't. Really, really sort of touched upon and as a sort of collective is is trying to talk about those underpinning values. You know, when you trust your neighbor, you have the sort of common shared values that your neighbor is going to sort of behave in certain ways that you can expect. And in other words, the less of there's less guesswork, less risk about talking to your neighbor than talking to someone who's that you may not be as familiar with or may not understand sort of their their their, their sort of how they approach certain events or experiences. So I think that's something that. Um, I, that I, I would hope that what this year will g give us an opportunity to do a reset on being able to more explicitly articulate those values and, um, and hold ourselves accountable to those values, uh, whether it's at a corporate level or whether it's at a government level. I think that's been a, a big issue. Um, I think, unfortunately, the schisms that we see in the politics um, we, there could be the same underlining values, but because of the messaging around that, it got all pear shaped. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a really interesting point about how people trust their neighbors and that sort of that the commu community level trust and how that's been eroded at a public institution level. Um, and at the same time, you've got sort of imperfect uh, access to data and information. And I think there are interesting models about how you can bring all of those things together. Um, an example of which is is in the US is, is something called Pulse Point. Uh, which has been rolled out in cities in the US. And basically, this is where you make emergency call data, 911 data, openly available. And then PulsePoint has developed this network of volunteer first responders who are people who are, you know, qualified, trained to, to be incident responders that augment uh, the formal first responders. And th this is an example, I think, of where you've got the municipality, the, the public institutions, putting data out there, bringing people in to sort of cooperate and collaborate whilst at the same time still delivering public services. And I think that's a model for the future in terms of rebuilding that um, trust, but also creating better um, decision making and access to information. Yeah, and, and I like where this is going in the sense that technology is an enabler for new forms of community and new forms of trust. And that's, of course, the diametrically opposite thing from technology that enables mm -hmm. um, competition at the edge, that I was, as I would call it. So if I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat, we're, we're trying to compete for voters. And so I'm trying to make myself look as, difficult, as different from you as I possibly can to get the voters on the margin, when what we should be doing really is say, well, we both care about this country and we just do it mm -hmm. in slightly different ways. But that's not a great message. And so the use of technology in building trust versus the use of technology in amplifying differences, uh, I think is going to be one of the big challenges for this year. And I hope it comes out the right way. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting when you think about social networks, because social networks, when they first came on the scene, it was seen as this great enabler of dialogue between people. You can communicate to one another. Um, it's going to make everybody understand each other better. It's going to make the world a better place. And And those are still true statements today. But I think we've also discovered that that's those same mechanisms, that same technology can also be used to sow the seeds of distrust um, and, and sending bad, bad messages out as well. Um, so it's, I think that's something that we still haven't quite figured out. Um, cause I, and I, and I do sometimes wonder whether some of the efforts to sort of, um, put a handle on social networking, whether that also has the end result of stifling positive conversations as well. And that's a, that's a worry. Well, so one of the things that continues to sort of turn in my head is about the whole, the whole social compact that's been challenged. I mean, you know, one of the, the, the reasons we all participate in these communities and allow government a certain amount of of responsibility and all, even all autonomy in terms of making decisions on our behalf is because that we have a, a particular agreement and expectations about that social compact. And um, we're willing to give up a certain amount of liberties with an exchange for some amount of securities. And the pandemic, as you all have said, is, you know, it's been the great accelerator of some of these big cracks that, that have shown that no longer the social compact continues to stand. And so, you know, the question I have in my mind is that, okay, so how do you reframe this social compact? Uh, what, what kinds of things can we do? What technology enabled solutions would help bridge the, these, these big gaps in, in what the social compact has been lost? And not just at a committee level, but at a global level, right? I mean, I think one of the things we should be, and I think it's an ex <clears throat> excellent point, and we have to look at what the fundamental driving incentives are underlying these technologies. Because I think one thing, just to go back to first principles here, is that lack of trust and skepticism have been are, are not new, right? I mean, and maybe even fundamental to some of the uh, societies that we live in. I mean, I think the U.S., uh, you know, the framers of our constitution were fundamentally quite skeptical people, um, and which is why we're set up the way we are in the U.S. But what's interesting is that with the in, with the advent of modern technology, the television and, and and radio followed by social media, the breaches in trust became much more real to people. So if you trace back the trends we're seeing today, you might make the argument that these were born around the time where Watergate and the Pentagon Papers were happening where uh, corporations were waging a war on facts because of, you know, if you read the merchants of doubt, you know, the, the carcinogens in smoking, et cetera. And that in the kind of 70s and early 80s starts to put you on a trend of mistrust enabled by how real it was for people because they're seeing it on TV and then eventually it's in their hands and their phones, right? And I think just to wrap up on this, it's it's the underlying incentives of technology that should give us a clue as to what's going to happen. And social media's underlying incentive is more screen time. And it's more fun to be skeptical with your friends than it is to just trust something and go do something, right? So the underlying, it's not that social media is inherently bad. It's that it's doing what it was meant to do, which is keep your So, so we we do talk about the social dialogue. Um, I think that that also, I mean, between government and individuals. But I think you're right, Oliver, that it, those same learnings, that same process is at play in in the corporate world between companies and their customers. Um, it's just a little more fluid in that. Um, a customer votes every day with who they want to do business with or where they want to spend time, whereas in, in an election cycle, there are cycles to it and it's sort of spread out. So maybe it's it's a slower process than what you might see in a corporate world, but it's the same fundamental principles at play. Well, and if I can just interject really quickly there, it, it used to, I worked on the Hill briefly and it was interesting to see how um, slow things were then compared to where they are now. So, you know, you'd send your representative to Congress and then they would, you know, have some time to do some things. And yes, you would get constituent mail. But now when people are tweeting every time a lawmaker passes something or, or votes or even says something, the the amplitude of the time they have to act, deal and react is much Hmm. That's that's interesting to boil that into the equation. I I do sometimes I think about also, um, and this this goes back to the COVID thing. Uh, I mean I think part of the problem there was um, some issues relates to the data. 
in that different data flow was flowing back upstream and people were either interpreting the same data differently or people had different data sets. And now the argument is not just is it data, is it science, but whose data and whose science is right. Um, and I think, I think as we go forward, I think we're going to see some of the, um, issues that we're now facing with social networking, I think we're going to have to address sort of by looking at the data and saying whose data is right. So one of the things that's uh, just to bring it back to the sort of mask analogy, because I think it, everybody knows that one really well. The challenge, I'll uh, give you just a perfect example, and this is also illustrated in um, Nature's October's issue, is that the whole idea of whether one mirror wears a mask or not, because there was such ambiguity about how the study was designed what kinds of studies were designed and the, the information that came out of those studies, um, really, it, it was like almost like describing the, the elephant where someone had a trunk and someone had a tusk and, and someone had legs, but they didn't quite understand the whole thing. And we still don't, just to be clear, we still don't. We still don't. And, um, and yet the messaging around that all is that because of the, um, the ambiguity, because of the inconclusivity of the science, um, people were stifled on how to act. And, and I'll just give you a, a counter example. You know, in the whole idea that the N95s are a gold standard um, to be used masks, WHO and the CDC, and, and even the kind of work that I do, they were actually sort of withholding the, the, the encouragement to actually for everyone, for all public to actually use the masks because they needed them for the first responders. And so there's this sort of push me pull you attention about, well, where, where, where does for this is supply and demand, right? Where, where can is the supply best served? And yet at the same time, there's a science that says, well, that's what you need to do in order to protect yourself and other people. So there's this tension that it created, um, not because of lack of information, not even because of even misinformation, it's because of the fact that it's inconclusive information and, and we're still learning, right? And, and how do you deal with that? It be, being data transparent, how do you be data transparent and say, we don't know what we know, we know what we know now, and this is what we're going to go forward, and somehow you have to trust us to to know that we're working on trying to get a better handle on things, but, you know, be there, be there for us. And that's been one of the biggest challenges because, as I said, it's back to the elephant analogy. Someone knows a trunk, someone knows a tusk, but they're not quite the whole thing. And then, and then as an overlay, you have... The, the leadership definition that is omniscient and omnipotent, which is even though all I know is the trunk, I'm still going to pretend I know the elephant because that's what expected from me as a leader. And so I hope in, in this recovery, actually, there's a little bit of a questioning of that uh, almost totalitarian view of leadership uh, because good leaders actually know when they don't have a clue and admit it. Um, and mm -hmm. that's better for everyone, including the leader. Glad you brought up leadership, though, because that, that was where I thought we might go next. I, I, I think a leadership is extremely tied to trust, right? And uh, it is not, it's not a hundred percent that a great leader can inspire a lot of trust, but isn't that one of the things that's a kind of a definitional aspect of great leadership? And so, you know, without pointing fingers or calling names, um, you know, uh, in the time when we were going through the Great Depression, the fireside chats with FDR were one of the hallmarks of the recovery because he got down, you know, kind of with the people and said things are tough and it was transparent and then said, here's what we're doing about it. And uh, and I do think that if we're going to re-inspire trust, it is not a small part of the solution to think about what role our leaders have to do and think about the most respected brands in the world. You can often name the CEO of those companies too. Just, you know, a thought like Unilever and people know it's Paul Pullman, right? Yeah, I agree with that. It's the, the, the openness and transparency is is fundamental. Um, but being honest, that they they don't have all the answers and they simply don't have um, all of the information, uh, and that it's a, it's a learning process. Um, because where mistrust creeps in is where uh, they make they make pronouncements in one direction or another, and then they have to backtrack on it. Um, and everybody knew that they were probably going to have to backtrack on it uh, later on. So how you have this two-way dialogue uh, where you ask people to accept the fact that there's a high degree of ambiguity, I think is fundamentally important. And and you can apply that to lots of other things. COVID, is, as you've said, has is, is highlighted it and accelerated it. But we're, we're living in a world where there are a lot of problems that are moving quite quickly. And we're also living in a world in which data-driven technology 
is completely transforming everything. And we can't pretend that government institutions and public leaders are, are, know how to get on top of this. They, they, they're going to have to get more agile and they're going to have to be more open uh, in the way that they work with us. And, and the thing that uh, personally amused me was the concept of science, which are in basic proper philosophy, the very definition of science is the falsification of hypotheses. And that's what sets mm -hmm. science apart from religion. And yet <laughs> in the pandemic, we were looking to science like religion, which obviously is the wrong way to do it. Science by definition is more often wrong than right. And that's a good thing about it because it, that's how it evolves. All right. All right. It, it's, it's interesting to think how, trust in the environment we're in today is going to change, call on new either leaders, existing leaders to develop new skills or a new generation of leaders. I mean, you think back of, of the, the people that we held as, as stellar corporate leaders 10 years ago, even the, the things that we're asking of leaders today and for the next 10 years, it's a very different skill set. I think with one exception, I think one of the things that's fallen by the wayside is that the leaders that we've had seen in the last, especially in the last few years, they've just not been good listeners. I think one of the things that the, the voice of people in terms of, you know, pinching on trust, right, is that I'm not feeling heard. I, I'm not feeling heard on a daily basis. I'm not feeling heard with regularity. And I think that's where the trust gets eroded. And so I think I would say that one of the, the overall aspects of the, that continues to be an important um, feature or, or uh, characteristic that leaders need to build is to be extremely good listeners and, and to listen carefully, mm. not as, not just what's being articulated, but what's not being articulated. And that's, that's hard, especially when they got, you know, all the highway of misinformation and all the other noise around that. And, and um, that's, that's a challenge. It might suggest that, um, well, two things come to mind. First of all, from our prior discussion, I was just thinking that, you know, good leadership and transparency kind of buys you the opportunity, kind of purchases you uh, the credibility to be wrong. Um, and so if you are transparent and you say, look, we, I mean, I, I thought that Tony Fauci did a pretty good job of this a few times to say like, yeah, well, we, this is why we were doing the mask thing in this way. And now we've seen a different way to do it. So here's, and you know, people had a fair amount, I mean, his trust ratings are still extremely high because people gave him the opportunity to be wrong, to admit it and move on. Cause I don't think anyone expects infallibility. It's a question no. of just, you know, how do you yeah. handle yourself to purchase the opportunity to be wrong? And I think the, the other quick thing that I'll mention is, it, um, it's worth some rumination as to whether or not there's a, a balanced place for the amount of information that society can handle. Um, I think we've been operating for a few decades now under the impression that the more information you can possibly put out there, the better. And one interesting thing about that is maybe it's in the manner in which it's consumed or maybe it's just the sheer volume. But what happens is that we're all now constantly swamped. And that includes leaders, right? When you're talking, I think it's a great point that leaders seem to listen less now. But also when you think about what leaders are dealing with, it's 10,000 emails a day, 26 meetings. And, you know, wh where is their listening time supposed to come from, right? And that goes down to the individual as well, who's being bombarded by seven open windows on their computers, their phones ringing all the time and the TV's going on in the background. We just should think about how much information is actually the Goldilocks amount of information to allow for trust in society. to. But aren't there, I, I can't we turn to some digital s solutions here as well, because because if, if leaders are uh, inundated with with emails and phone calls and so on, then 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 then, then they're not really engaging brilliantly with 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 some of the digital tools that are available. Um, I think asking the crowd um, and engaging with the crowd using digital tools um, and tools for participatory democracy and that kind of thing um, should enable you to be able to sort of build a dialogue and a conversation without, yeah, without sort of yeah, emails and, and sort of yeah, things that you just can't cope with, I guess. <laughs> I, I also think it's true. I mean, and, and Gail said you, you, people aren't listening. But I think when people – that doesn't mean that leaders aren't talking to people. But when they come off as, well, here's a speech, here's a platitude, that's that's easy to do. Um, what they're really looking for is, is because there's so much openness and sharing of information, they're looking for those messages to be 
echoed by the rest of the organization. And then those messages have to be backed up with action. And people are pretty quick to spot discontinuities. Well, you said this, obviously you heard me, but your organization or all these other people are doing this other thing. So obviously what you said was just air. So, yeah, so that, that, that makes leadership really hard because you not just have to inspire customers or the people you're talking to, but you've also got to um, drive that message to your employees. And I would say that that same thing lies true with partners. And then unless you're sort of driving a consistent message, philosophy, and a set of actions across all those parties, um, you're, you're going to suffer a failure. I think one of yeah. the things we talk about action, though, in the messaging is this sort of clear expectations about how the message and the action are, are, are going to be uh, experienced. And I think that's where some of the disconnect happens is because what I heard you say and what my expectations are, and what are articulated, yeah. and the actions that were the result of that can be a chasm apart, right? And so uh, whether it's in corporations or partnerships or whether it's at the government level, I think one of the challenges that the government has to face compared to corporations is that uh, corporate, the, 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 some of the drivers of corporations, that they have the luxury in some respects to be very focused, right? But when the government, you're sort of penibular, you've got all this other, all these constituents and, and multiple, multiple and very complex needs, whereas corporations have a different kind of a driver sense and so there is that that sort of um i don't know if you if you can help governments be more corporate like uh but i think one of the the challenges uh like going back to setting clear expectations is how do you deliver on those expectations and if you you all goodwill you don't have the budget resources skill sets time uh competing priorities uh, that that becomes different and in, in versus some corporations where you just you, know, you can be a lot more um, tunnel vision. Yeah, there's a fundamental difference in the sense that as a corporation, I have the luxury to choose my customers uh, in, in a way, whereas as a government, my customer base is pretty fixed. And it, we've recently seen, I think, a polarization driven by zero-sum game thinking where one part of the society demonizes the other part so much that it becomes exclusionary. And in, in one of my former experiences at the World Economic Forum, our mantra was always, as, as long as we talk to everyone, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> and that actually works really well until one part of the people you talk to says, I'm not dealing with you unless you stop talking to the rest of the world. <laughs> so you get... Uh, hard-nosed competition between subgroups in society and politics and that, that is possibly properly toxic because to get back from there is is something we haven't dealt with in a long time so De- deloitte like recently did um a paper that was i thought was pretty interesting and and they sort of said there were four components to trust um one of them was the humanity um, and basically empathy, uh, uh, it goes back to the point of are you hearing people? Do you really care about what they're saying? I mean, and that, that sort of has to be expressed in the process. Part of it was transparency um, in that are you, are you really fully disclosing everything? Or are you sort of cherry picking the facts? Are you are you so not just the motivation, but are you transparent about the process? Part of it is capability or capacity. I mean, are you even capable of being trusted? Um, I mean, if, if a company is not capable of, of doing um, hacker protection, I mean, if they say they're going to do this and they really have no control over it, um, it really says that there's a capacity issue. And, and then the other part that, they, that Deloitte pointed out was reliability because they want to see that same message, those same actions. Not It's not just one speech and then let's do this, but I want to see this over time um, so that people re- will know reliably, here's here's what I can expect from that, that person when put in um, an untested situation. Yeah, I think the, the point about um, capability or, or competence is is important, which is that, um, you know, one tool for dealing with that is, is, is being more open and engaging engaging the private sector, engaging citizens in 
in the in innovation, in action, and decision making, and so on. Um, and I think one of, one of the problems we have is is that the public public services have sort of become these enormous grey buildings that are supposed to be the experts. And again, sort of they're either the sheriff or they're the pizza delivery mentality, rather than this sort of much more open and collaborative approach. Um, an example that you have in the US, I think, which is really good on this front, is is challenge.gov, where federal government admits we don't have the R and D capability. We don't know. We don't know how to how to solve um, uh, all of these problems. And so we're going to go out to the crowd, and we're going to we're going to source and identify the most uh, exciting and compelling uh, propositions. And and it's it's that that I think needs to to. To, we, we need a lot more of that if we're going to if we're going to rebuild trust and build up the competency of our public institutions. Agreed. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Hey, hey, Ben. Nope. All right. So, um, so what what other things? What other advice? Like, would you guys suggest to leaders? I mean, we've been talking about this. Like, this is a. Uh, this is a very leader-driven, building trust is a leader-driven process, but it's, it's really more complicated than that, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, I, I, I remember that Deloitte uh, piece as well, and I, I remember thinking that there were a couple things missing. I mean, one of them, and maybe it comes from that idea of reliability that builds this, but is reputation, right? I mean, people uh, saying this person's trustworthy, you should listen to what they're saying is really important because a lot of us build trust in that way. It goes back to the trust your neighbors kind of thing, but you can build reputation in a number of ways. It's essentially uh, trust capital, right, um, that you can then use in various ways. Uh, and then the other thing is something that goes back to what Gail said in her very first comment, which was a shared values. One of the reasons that we um, trust each other, or for example, a, a shared value might be that we trust in uh, education and therefore someone's credentials are worthy of trust. And so if I might not know John, but if his name is Dr. John, then I'm going to give Dr. John a little bit more credibility when he's talking about things that a doctor might know about. And uh, those things have been eroding quite a bit. And so in the, you know, the world of, of um, you know, what if we're giving advice to leaders, it's, you know, remember, uh, trust is, you know, built over a lifetime and lost in a day. You are under unbelievable scrutiny in a way that is heretofore completely unheard of in society. Be very careful about your reputation and credibility capital. And then also, you know, do everything possible to build on some shared values and create some some uh, indicators of where people can um, see things about you, your background, or your team that builds trust in what you're saying. Because it's never just right. And to build on that, I think that one of the things that that's, has been lacking, and probably you know, it's, it's actually sort of a reflection of the last four years that we've experienced in the United States, is that if you're able to to actually provide demonstrative action. In other words, you're able to show that you've actually accomplished something that you intended to. I think that's where people say, okay, I've got it. And even if it's just measures, but there are there's significant measures that are articulated. I think one of the things that a lot of leaders often forget is that what they, that what they may have accomplished internally is not being seen externally. So really putting yourself out there and saying, here's, and, and also more importantly, is that um, one of the things that I see lacking in, in, in a lot of leadership around the world is actually talking about the sort of end state. So, you know, here's, here's what we've accomplished and it leads to the end state of what we hope to attain. And I think that's sometimes leaders are very squishy about that because that actually basically articulates your values in a very strong way. But I think it's important because that's that clear messaging and, and less um, confusion around that that doesn't often get sort of explicitly articulated. We don't have much time left, but um, one thing I'd sort of like to bridge a little bit to is is with trust being so low, and we're giving advice for leaders and talking about how to build trust. But I think there's there's a segment of the population that just sort of assumes that we're never going to rebuild trust and we're going to have to learn to operate in an untrusted environment. Um, and I kind of wonder what you guys think about that. Be impossible would be, yeah, <laughs> impossible would, be, would be my answer. Without trust, there is no society. And right. uh, echoing an earlier point. But as a quick note, Michael, I, I think uh, 
I think one thing we need to recognize, and uh, Horasis as, a, as an organization has a broad historical perspective, is that um, society is functioning at a level that they function for the last hundred or so years are, is very unusual in history. And it's not a guarantee, right? And we've had periods in human history where trust was at an all-time low and things fractured down to very small communities, right? I mean, I don't want to say the dark ages, but my only point here is to say that I am an optimist and I believe we're not going there. But like, that's what lack of trust looks like, right? Like there is a, there, we have experienced this before and it's not a great place to. Yeah. And that's, uh, and if, if I look a little bit at the title of American solutions for an impact that recovery, there are two things that give me hope. One is America historically, at least since its existence, been very good about having an inclusive vision for the country that isn't, let's go to war with someone else and take their land, but let's build this ourselves. And so that, that narrative still gives me hope. And then America is also a highly iterative system as a society and as an economy. And that will also help in, in my views where America is great at trying things out. And the recent vaccine rollout is a good example. It looked very messy in December. And now all of a sudden, through process of trial and error, we figured it out and it looks pretty good. That's that's good. That's good. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful for the future too, but I do think it takes a lot of reinforcement. Um, I th- I think there is the market does reinforce and and reward people who are trying to build trust, and I think it does punish those who are sort of working against it and trying to sort of I'll say manipulate the system or or whatever. Um, I I do think though that the actions we take today um, to build trust. I mean, you might not see their impact for a year, two, three years. Um, It goes back that it's easy. It's hard to build trust. But if you start working on it today, you start seeing the results coming around. Um, So that's, that's good. So one of the things that I I'm very hopeful for is that we're now Starting to attend to some of the Maslow's hierarchy and needs that sort of got lost in the, in the shuffle in the last several years. And I think that's something that people have taken for granted up until recently. And so with that, because now we're sort of all in the collective boat, um, I, I'm very hopeful that people are just more cognizant that you know, some of the basic things, food, shelter, um, the ability to uh, have some self-agency, the ability to have some uh, certain amount of, of financial uh, threshold that you can, that you can expect on a daily basis. I think now that there were sort of on that same boat, uh, is, is start to, you know, rise to the top now where people are more conscientious. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> 